All right, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I'm, I'm sorry that I can't be there in person, uh, but I'm happy that I can at least participate from the distance. So I'm going to uh, talk about duality and higher derivatives. And this is based on um, a, a series of papers I've written with num numerous people, including uh, Barton Swiebach, Camille Eloy, Henning Samtleben, Roberto Bonazzi, Felipe Diaz, uh, who's a student of mine, uh, Roberto is a postdoc, uh, Tomas Godina, another student, uh, and Diego Marquez. Um, and so I should say that what I will tell you about today uh, is very much in the spirit of uh, traditional thinking of dualities in string theory, where you perform a compactification, meaning that you consider a theory on a particular background, and then you uh, ex exhibit certain dualities. And the question I want to explore is how do these dualities work if you switch on alpha prime corrections? So this is something people could have done uh, in the 80s or 90s, uh, but didn't, at least uh, they didn't push us very far. Um, but for me, this is really much um, a continuation of a much broader research program, which goes under the name of double field theory, uh, where we realized that the inclusion of alpha prime corrections leads to various uh, subtleties and unexpected features. So double field theory is a framework that is supposed to make certain dualities manifest without having to do these compactifications I mentioned before. And there we realized that there are certain unexpected features. So this goes back to work with uh, Warren Siegel and Barton Zwiebach, and then later with Zwiebach. And there's also important work by other people, uh, including here. Um, so we realized that there are certain funny things happening that we wouldn't expect. And only later did we appreciate that this, these are features that are already present in the conventional way of thinking about it, that uh, they're not really uh, related to double field theory, but that can be seen already at the level of conventional compactifications. Okay, here's the plan of my talk. So I will be, uh, begin with one slide of a very brief review of uh, the duality I'm interested in, which is just the simplest T duality. Um, and I will say a few word, words about the higher derivative alpha prime corrections, which are expected to preserve the t-duality transformation rules. Um, well, not exactly the transformation rules, but the presence of the t-duality is expected to be preserved. And after this brief um, introduction, I will, in the rest of the talk, introduce uh, three uh, broad uh, research results. Uh, the first is on the classification of alpha prime corrections in, the, in a very simple setting, namely that of cosmological backgrounds. So that effectively means that you consider backgrounds that depend only on one coordinate, which is time. And so effectively, one does a reduction to one dimension. And it turns out that in this case, things simplify so much that you can give a complete classification of all possible alpha prime corrections to any order in alpha prime. Now that classification means that at each order in alpha prime there's still a finite number of free coefficients that are not fixed by duality as one would expect um, but at least we have now completely nailed down what is really the what are the things that are not fixed by duality and uh, what is really the the real input that must be uh, fixed by other methods then in the second part uh, i will go to more general compactification. So I consider dimensional reductions to any number of dimensions, not just one, um, and ask how does the ODDR symmetry, which I will review in a second, uh, this is the T-duality group, um, work in presence of alpha prime corrections. And here we find a new feature that uh, was not visible in the reduction to one dimension, uh, which is that the ODDR transformations necessarily must themselves receive alpha prime corrections. So the ODD action uh, itself has to be changed. And this change will take place in the form of, uh, of a generalized Green-Schwartz mechanism. So this has a very natural analogy to, the, to basically the first superstring revolution, where it was realized uh, that certain anomalies uh, could in fact be canceled uh, by, a, by a subtle change of the naive gauge transformations that you would expect in the theory, and this is the Green-Schwarz mechanism. And in the same way that there is a world sheet interpretation for this uh, mechanism, uh, 
in let's say heterotic string theory, there's a world sheet interpretation for this uh, mechanism we found here. So this will bring me to the last part of my talk um, in which I will introduce a duality invariant world sheet. So a world sheet formulation where this T duality group is already uh, built in from the start. And I will explain that this generically has anomalies uh, that however can be canceled precisely by this green Schwartz mechanism. So this gives a world sheet interpretation uh, for this target space phenomenon, phenomenon that we found by direct dimensional reduction. Okay, so now let me start with a brief review of T-duality. Um, so T-duality describes the phenomenon uh, that on toroidal backgrounds, TD, so the, here we have a D-dimensional torus, I have a certain duality that relates uh, backgrounds uh, to different backgrounds that however are physically equivalent. So specifically, if you have a background metric GIJ, which I take to be constant, and similarly constant background B field, I can combine this into this general uh, non-symmetric D by D matrix E. And then the T-duality transformation is given by this fractional linear transformation here. So E prime is the new background and these matrices A, B, C, D are D by D matrices. Uh, which are such that, that if you build an, a 2D by 2D matrix, this is actually a group element of the group O, D, D. So O, D, D is the non-compact group that leaves the metric of signature D, D invariant. And the claim is if you build such a matrix and you apply this uh, fractional linear transformation, then uh, the new background obtained in this way is physically equivalent. So the statement would be that there's no experiment that you can do in this new background that would distinguish it from the original one. Um, now this, has, this can be explained or derived in, in many ways, but perhaps the, the, the most general discussion of this can be given in closed string field theory, as done by Kubo and Zwiebach in the 90s. Uh, where you can uh, explicitly check that if you change uh, the background, so you have a closed string field theory on any background, if you go from one background to the other, you can compensate, uh, you can go back by field redefinition. So they're really physically equivalent. Now, it's, it's useful to, to precisely understand which part of the statement is non-trivial. Um, so a subgroup of this ODD, of course, you would expect to be there. For instance, you can look at the GLD subgroup, which you can just interpret as, as global diffeomorphisms of the torus. So any theory of gravity should have this invariance group. So that symmetry you're not, you're not surprised by. And similarly, you can uh, shift the B fields. So in presence of the B fields there, you can shift it by a constant since it only appears under derivatives. And so you have a shift by this number of anti-symmetric constants. So this part of the subgroup, so of the ODD group, which is sometimes called the geometric subgroup, is, is, is not surprising. Um, but the OD, full ODD group, of course, has much more in it. And under the, such a genuine T-duality transformations that do not belong to this geometric subgroup, um, you in fact map, map Kaluza Klein modes to winding modes. So any string theory on such a background, since you have a torus, has Kaluza Klein modes, as any theory of gravity would have. But importantly, in string theory, those Kaluza Klein modes are doubled. They're paired up with so-called winding modes, which are extra states in the theory. Um, and those states are mapped into each other under T duality. So it's clear that uh, unless you have both of them, you don't see the T duality. Now, since you are on a torus, um, uh, you have periodicity conditions of the fields. So that brings in the Kaluza Klein modes. You have a field that has periodicity conditions, so you can Fourier transform, and that defines the Kaluza Klein modes. Now, you have to preserve these periodicity conditions, and that really tells you that the duality group is the discrete ODD set. So the discrete version comes about because you're really on a torus. So that's, that's the general T duality group. Uh, and that always uh, or very often leads to a lot of confusion because people think unless you have really the discrete group, you're not discussing T-duality. Now, it's easy to understand, however, that in certain truncations, you see a larger symmetry than ODDZ that, however, can be understood in terms of this T-duality property we had to begin with. Namely, if you truncate to the massless fields, uh, the duality symmetry is enhanced to the uh, continuous group ODDR. And why is that? Well, truncating to the massless fields means 
that you throw away all Kaluza Klein modes and all winding modes. So they are in fact massive states. So truncating to the massless fields means you throw them out. And since you throw them out as complete ODD multiplets, so they transform into each other, so you have to throw out both of them, uh, you preserve, in fact, the ODD. And not only do you preserve the ODD, the ODD that you end up seeing is enhanced because all memory of the torus is gone. By truncating the massless fields, I don't see the torus topology or anything, really. So that explains why I really get an ODDR symmetry. So that's the uh, setup I, I will exclusively work in in this in this talk, um, and so there's the general uh, theorem or statement due to Ashok Sen from the early '90s um, that I will work with and confirm here, which is that classical string theory with d-dimensional translation invariants features a global ODDR symmetry to all orders in alpha prime. So d-dimensional translation invariance is, is just a fancy way of saying that you take your fields to be independent of d-coordinates, so that if you shift along those directions, nothing happens. And if you consider string theory in this setting, uh, you must get a global ODDR continuous symmetry, uh, in fact, to all orders in alpha prime. There's a simple proof for this, uh, and in fact, we'll see that it works. Now, by very general string theory arguments, it is guaranteed that there's this ODDR symmetry, but of course that doesn't tell you how it actually acts. And we will see that beyond the zeroth order in alpha prime, this is a very uh, subtle issue to figure out, uh, to actually exhibit the ODDR symmetry. Olaf, can I ask you a question? Yes, uh, please. This, uh, in the case of translation invariance, this ODDR includes the time direction? Um, well, usually it doesn't. Uh, so usually we think of comp uh, of the d-dimensional translations being along Euclidean directions. Mm -hmm. And this will be exclusively the setup I'm working with. Now, I think uh, it, 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 it generalizes where you, um, where you can also take uh, the time to sort of, the, you can take fields to not depend on time, and then you still should have a duality property. Um, so I think it actually generalizes, but I will not use it in this talk. Okay. All right. So let me then come to the first part, which is uh, cosmological reductions. Um, so so what, do, what do I mean by dimensional reduction? So let's start uh, with the, the massless fields of string theory, let's say in 10 or 26 dimension, it doesn't really matter for, for my purposes. And I will focus on, on the universal sector, which consists of the space-time metric G mu nu, the anti-symmetric tensor B mu nu, the Calbramont field, and the scalar field phi, which is the dilaton. And then we have a space-time action, which looks like this, which is written in string frame. So it means you have the Einstein-Hilbert term, but multiplied by, uh, by the dilaton. You have a kinetic term for the dilaton and for the B field, where H is the three form curvature for the two form. So now uh, we do dimensional reduction to one dimension. And this one dimension I take to be a uh, time. So you can think of uh, in the context of cosmology as cosmic time. And we make the following ansatz. So you have the zero zero component of the metric, which is the lapse function which depends on time. You have the spatial components of the metric depending on time. Now for the B field, you write the same answers. There's no zero, zero component, of course, for, um, for an anti-symmetric tensor. And also the scalar dilaton you just take to be time dependent. So that means you take this action, you throw away all derivatives that are not time derivatives, so that are not a dot, if you like. And so it simplifies dramatically, of course, and what you end up with is an action in one dimension. So here's the one dimensional time integral, uh, with, which is quadratic, which you can write in a form that is quadratic in first order derivatives of the basic fields, which are the metric G, the, the internal metric G, which is this block here, the internal B field B, which is this block here, and the dilaton phi, which was redefined here in this fashion. So we've redefined it as the determinant of the spatial metric. Um, and anyone knowing T-duality will of course recognize this thing. 
Um, but here it's just a, it's just the field redefinition that simplifies things. Now, structurally, this kind of action is, of course, exactly what you would expect for any theory of gravity, uh, any two derivative theory of gravity, if something was two time derivatives um, in this fashion. But it turns out that this action, because of this precise way of combining, uh, combining the metric with the B field and the dilaton, has an extra symmetry or has a hidden duality property. And this is this OD, D symmetry. And this can be brought out as follows. So for this, it is easiest to reorganize the fields into a 2D by 2D matrix. So this little d is now the total number of dimensions minus one. So it would be nine, let's say, if you start from 10 dimensional string theory. Um, so it's the number of spatial dimensions which we have compactified. And now you build this matrix H which consists of the spatial metric G, the spatial B field B, and you build this particular nonlinear combination. And the indices capital MN run from one to two D. And now this nonlinear form of this matrix uh, is, is, is fixed by the requirement that this is in fact an ODD group matrix, or more precisely, it belongs to the coset space. And this fact can be expressed in various ways, but for me, the easiest for now is to stated in terms of this uh, metric matrix S where I raised one index by means of the ODD invariant metric. So eta here is the ODD invariant metric, which I will take to have this off diagonal form. You can quickly convince yourselves this in fact uh, has signature D comma D. And then I built this object S with upper and lower indices so they can actually take the square of it. And the constraint is that the square is to one. So this is not a general 2D by 2D matrix, but rather it's a constrained one, which satisfies S squared equal to one. And this in turn is the reason why this is the most general parametrization. The most general parametrization of H or equivalently S is in terms of a symmetric tensor G and an anti-symmetric tensor B. And now if you take this uh, one dimensional action, which we had here, it turns out that it can be very nicely rewritten in this form here, just in terms of this matrix S. So you have a phi dot square term and trace S dot square term, and this is it. And so this was uh, first pointed out uh, by Meissner and Veneziano in the early 90s. And this form of the action, of course, now makes it manifest that it has an O D comma D invariance. So if you take this matrix S and you rotate it with H and H minus one, according to its index structure, where little h here is an, an arbitrary ODDR matrix, uh, then of course this is an invariance of the action because here you have the trace and it just uh, it drops out, the h drops out. Um, and you just take the dilaton itself to be invariant, phi prime equals to phi. And that was the reason why we did this redefinition on the previous slide. It turns out that you have to do this redefinition in order to make it so simple. Um, now here it's important to understand why this is only an ODD symmetry and not a general GLD symmetry. And that's simply because S itself is a constrained object. Uh, it, it belongs to this ODD coset. And so only an ODD rotation preserves the constraint of this object. But in any case, now here we have the ODD symmetry. So this is a very simple story. Uh, the computations are very simple. You just take the action, you throw away all the derivatives, but the time derivatives, the dot, and then you just have to reorganize in terms of this matrix, which maybe it's a little tedious because it's this nonlinear form, but then you get this very nice explicit form of the symmetry. So the question now is, how does this extend to higher order and alpha prime? So suppose you start not with this action, well, you always start with this action, but now you include higher derivative alpha prime corrections. And in fact, we know in string theory, there's an infinite series of higher derivative alpha prime corrections, starting with Riemann squared and all kinds of higher derivative terms. And now suppose you do try to do the same computation and you, which of course now is much more complicated because of the higher derivatives. And then you try to see if you can bring it into, into this matrix form to realize the same symmetry. So this was um, done to first order alpha prime by Christoph Meissner, another paper in the later 90s, I think 97 or so. And basically what happens is it doesn't work anymore in the way you would naively think. If you just take the naive dimensional reduction and try to group everything into this matrix, it doesn't work anymore. So rather what has to happen is that you do uh, 
uh, you have to do a series of elaborate field redefinitions to bring everything into a canonical form. And only then uh, can you realize um, the ODD symmetry. Uh, so to say it differently, you can still write the theory in terms of this matrix HMN, but now the G and the B are not the standard supergravity G and B you started with in, in 10 dimensions and made this naive simple reduction ansatz, the, the one we had here, but rather this itself gets uh, alpha prime corrected in a complicated fashion. Uh, so these expressions for G and B have complicated alpha prime corrections, but at the end, you can just think of them as field redefinitions, which of course we know doesn't change the physics. Um, but doing that, you can make the, you can realize the ODD symmetry to first order and alpha prime. Um, and in fact, you can even beyond that and classify what you have to arbitrary order and alpha prime. So this is the key results here, uh, is the classification of cosmological duality invariance. So the statement is that the general possible actions you can have uh, are of a very simple form and manifestly ODD invariant. And this very simple form uh, only comes about if you exploit all possible field redefinitions. And this really includes two kinds of field redefinitions. It includes the sort of non-ODD covariant field redefinitions that you get, that you have to do just to bring it into this uh, form of this matrix S. But once you have that, it exploits even more field redefinitions that removes uh, many of possible ODD invariant terms you could add here. So what this shows in particular is that to first order an alpha prime, there's really only one invariant you have to add, which is trace S dot to the fourth. So this has four derivatives as it should be to be first order an alpha prime. And this is the natural partner of this trace S dot squared here. Now in principle, you could have you could write my, uh, several more terms here, even to first order an alpha prime that are duality invariant. So you could have a trace S dot squared squared, or you could have trace S dot squared phi dot squared. You could write things with the dilaton. And in fact, in the first paper by Meissner, it, was, it, it did look much more complicated. But the statement is that even once you have it in this duality invariant form, you can still do duality covariant field redefinitions and eliminate all these terms. So the only coefficient here that has a real physical meaning is the leading one, C, which we call C20. So this is a coefficient that is not fixed by duality and has to be fixed for the various string theories by other methods. And similarly, if you go to, first, to second order in alpha prime, there's only one term that you need to include, which is trace S dot to the six. And only if you go to third order and alpha prime is there a second term you have to include that is not removable by field definitions. And similarly, it to first order and alpha prime. And then the general pattern is the following. So first of all, you only need first order time derivatives, which is already a, a non-trivial statement because you could have expected why is there not an S double dot squared here or something like this. So if you would allow um, higher order time derivatives, there's much more you can write, but the statement which we proved is that upon integrating by parts and exploiting field redefinition, you can all you can always remove them. So the second thing is that you only have even powers of S dot that just follows from the duality property. So an, an, an odd power just vanishes by the ODD invariant, so by the group property of this matrix. Uh, the third thing is that you don't need to include any higher derivatives of phi. Um, so here there are no derivatives phi. There's the phi dot squared in the two derivative term, but then in all higher derivative terms, there's no phi dot needed. Any derivative of phi can be removed by field redefinitions. And finally, you don't need to include any trace of S dot squared itself. So that's why here you get a trace S dot to the four squared, but you don't have to have a trace S dot squared squared first order something like that and given this result uh, a simple argument then allows you to just count the number of free parameters at each order in alpha prime so at order alpha prime k uh, the number of free parameters uh, like the c's here which are not fixed by duality is given by this combination here where p of k is the function number theoretic functions which gives you the number of partitions of the integer k so the number of ways to write k is the sum of lower in, uh, lower integers. So that's just a fun fact here. Uh, 
So the claim is this is the complete classification. Any string theory compactified to one dimension or subject to a cosmological ansatz to all of an alpha prime must take this form or must be writable in this form upon using field definitions. Okay, so now the question is, well, uh, that's nice, but what are these coefficients? And of course, we don't know, um, but what we have done is uh, to try to fix them to low orders in alpha prime. Um, and this is uh, work uh, with uh, my student, Thomas Godina and uh, Diego Marquez. Uh, first uh, was just for the type two case, which appeared earlier this year and uh, a longer, more recent paper that tried to do uh, the, the, these four theories, which is bosonic string theory, heterotic string theory, and type two, and also th uh, theory, which is not the proper string theory, some kind of chiral uh, version of string theory, which uh, was uh, constructed by myself, uh, Siegel and Spiebach um, in 2013, uh, which is sort of a bit like a toy model that is exactly duality invariant to all orders in, in derivatives. Okay, so what we did is why we took the higher derivative corrections you could uh, get from the literature and tried to go through this procedure of doing the dimensional reduction, doing all field redefinitions, and then uh, fixing the coefficients in the process. And, and here's, the, here's the result. Um, so here are just some numbers. Um, so a few things to observe. Um, so first of all, for um, bosonic and heterotic uh, theories, they both start at order alpha prime, but differ by a factor of one half. Um, bosonic string theory has an alpha prime squared corrections, which comes from a Riemann cube term, which however is not present in heterotic string theories. So there's a zero here. And then type two string theory really doesn't have uh, an alpha prime or alpha prime squared corrections. They only start at order alpha prime cube. Uh, where famously you have the uh, invariant with Riemann to the fourth and coefficient given by the transcendental number zeta of three. So that's why zeta of three shows up here. And of course, the zeta of three is not fixed by any ODD argument. It's just, it has to be fixed in terms of uh, external information. And that's what we did here. So um, just some curious uh, points to, um, um, to, to point out in this analysis. Uh, which is that you don't actually need to know the complete alpha prime corrections in order to fix those coefficients because duality itself uh, helps you in the process. And uh, what I mean by this is uh, illustrated by an example. So let's look at type two string theory, um, where we know that as a leading correction of this form here, it has four powers of the Riemann tensor. And there's a particular complicated tensor structure called T8 that constructs the indices, which you can find in the literature. Um, and this leading term was fixed uh, long ago in a, a famous paper by Gross and Witten, where they looked at the four point uh, scattering amplitude in type two string theory and matched this with a, with a gravitational action and found that you have to have this R to the four term. But in general, this is just one term in a very long complicated list of alpha prime corrections. Um, and in, in fact, we don't really know the complete alpha prime corrections. I should say there was very recently a proposal uh, for the complete alpha prime corrections, but uh, basically until recently, we didn't even know what the complete alpha prime corrections, just to leading order for type two theory, are. leading order meaning here alpha prime cube. Now, um, what you can say is that if you look only at the gravitational sector, uh, whatever it is, it must be such that the four point amplitude is what is predicted by this term. So what this tells you is that the purely gravitational sector can only add higher order terms that do not contribute uh, to the four point amplitude. And this is, for instance, a term like this, uh, which is a gauss bonnet like term. So this E10, E10 me just means that you have a particular contraction of epsilon tensors. Hola. Is such that, uh, yes? Yes, excuse me a question. There is some reason to separate to do are those two R to the fourth terms, or there are some different contraction of Riemann tensor? Yeah, so there's a difference, there's a reason. So the difference is that this combination here, that's what I was just trying to explain, is, uh, is Gauss-Bonnet 
like in the sense that if you expand this around flat space, let's say, uh, it doesn't contribute to to uh, to 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 quartic order, but only to higher order, meaning that it doesn't contribute to the four point scattering amplitude. Mm -hmm. So it's like the Gauss Bonnet quadratic in Riemann tensor in four or higher dimensions, which doesn't co contribute to the quadratic terms. And this means that the computation of Gross and Witten, which fixed this term, uh, couldn't fix uh, this term because it only adds to, uh, was only contributes to higher order. Um, and then there are also terms involving the Ricci tensor, which are removable by field redefinitions, and so do not are not relevant for the scattering amplitude computation. So th this is the reason for this separation. Um, now, the point I want to make is that this coefficient here, so from this just sort of pure amplitude argument, you would not know what this coefficient is, but it has been fixed by various methods in the literature. And this duality uh, covariant reasoning that I'm following here also allows you, gives you an independent way to fix the coefficient. Um, and this works as follows. So you do the dimensional reduction of this term to one dimension. And here we write it in terms of this matrix G dot G minus one, which I called L. And you get a result that looks like this. Now, the point is that uh, any even powers of L's can be enhanced to something ODD invariant, something expressible in terms of this matrix S, the ODD covariant matrix S, which I had before. But in general, you also get something that involves odd powers of L. And these odd powers are not expressible in terms of S. Um, which means they are not compatible with the ODD uh, invariance. So this comes with the coefficient one minus C, and so an only the only way to uh, uh, to have ODD invariance means that I have to set C equal to one so that this disappears. And this was in fact uh, the that that is in fact the coefficient that was fixed uh, or known in the literature by various other methods. So that's just an, an illustration of the general phenomenon that just given the purely gravitational couplings, or even just a subset of the purely gravitational couplings, the method allows us to fix the coefficient um, that, that must multiply this duality invariant term. So when the C is fixed, you can go through the computation and find the right coefficient, which is given here. And a similar phenomenon exists already for bosonic string theory, where at order alpha prime squared, there's a Riemann cube term um, but there's also a gauss bonnet like term to that order, which means it doesn't actually contribute to the cubic couplings, but only to higher order. And again, you can fix the relative coefficient between the Riemann cube and the gauss bonnet like term by these duality uh, reasonings, and you find that coefficient. So you cannot fix the overall coefficient, like the zeta of three in type two, but you can fix the relative coefficient. So then given only partial knowledge of uh, the high derivative um, higher derivative, sorry, higher dimensional, higher derivative terms, you can fix those coefficients. Okay, so that means we have now fixed those coefficients for all string theories to this order in alpha prime cube. Um, but of course, there are infinitely more, so we're still not that far after all. But uh, anyway, uh, even without having that, we can uh, start playing with the possible applications in cosmology. Um, so let's just see structurally what happens if we apply this to a friedman lemaitre robertson walker So let's take the spatial metric uh, to be just the delta ij multiplied by one scale factor a of t. So that's the cosmological ansatz. We set the B field to zero, and then the, the result can be expressed in terms uh, of the so-called Hubble parameter h, which is a dot over a. And now if you take this general uh, theory of the structural form and you work out the equations of motion, you plug in this cosmological action. It turns out uh, that the answer, of course, depends on this infinitely many unknown coefficients, but it can be written very efficiently in terms of a single sort of generating function f of h, function of the Hubble parameter, uh, as an alpha prime expansion involving these coefficients ck and even powers of the Hubble parameter. So if I define this function f of h, um, then I can express the equations of motion, the, the all order and alpha prime equations of motion in this very simple form given here, where the small f of h is just the derivative f prime of the capital F 
uh, prime being the derivative with respect to the Hubble parameter. And in terms of the function g of h, which is this combination of capital F of h here. So you can think of this first equation, which tells you that this combination is, is constant at time, is the Noether theorem, the, 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 um, the, the Noether conservation law following from ODD invariance. And this is the zero, zero component of the Einstein equations or the Hamiltonian constraint. So um, as I emphasized many times, there's of course an infinite number of free parameters, CK, that you don't know. But you know, whatever the string theory you're considering, this must be the exact equations to all orders in alpha prime for any string theory. So um, just by this structural form, you can pl uh, play with it and in particular discuss the perturbative solutions of the um, equations. So you can look at the structural time dependence uh, of the perturbative solutions of uh, simple cosmological settings. Um, but you can also try to go beyond this and ask simple questions like, is it conceivable there is, for instance, a non-perturbative de Sitter solution? A de Sitter solution means that the Hubble parameter is just constant. So H is equal to H naught, it's just a number. Um, and if you plug this in here, you can state simple criteria for these functions to satisfy to have such a, a non-perturbative solution. And uh, you can just display uh, uh, simple functions f of h that have their property. Of course, we don't know if any string theory would belong to that class, because we don't know what these coefficients are, but it is at least on some level a proof of principle that there's no reason why you shouldn't have to sit a vacuum in some non-standard, non-perturbative fashion. Okay, I'm, I'm going a little too slow, I realize now, um, but this is the end of the first part. Are there any questions so far before I go to the next one? Uh, one question, these non-perturbative de Sitter solutions, um, the curvature would be of the uh, string length scale? Um, you the mean what's that? The characteristic yes. length, the characteristic right. so length of sets, this de Sitter solution. Yeah, yeah, so you are asking what sets the, well, the value of the cosmological constant? Yeah. And indeed, it's, it's in terms of uh, of alpha prime. Mm -hmm. So, so that means that they are not uh, unless they're not some phenomenologically miracle happens. relevant. Sorry, they're not phenom phenomenologically relevant. No, no, unless unless there's some conspiracy happening with these coefficients that the that the sort of the, that the coefficient multiplying the appropriate power of alpha prime comes out to be. I don't know, whatever you need to make it work. Uh, unless there's some conspiracy of that type, uh, you, you have the same cosmological constant problem. Okay, thanks. Maybe I have a question. What yes. do you mean by non perturbative? It means that this function big F of H uh, is not analytical? No, I mean by this, um, uh, so the two derivative equations don't have the sitter solutions, period. So mm -hmm. you, you would not uh, have a solutions of the, of the two derivative equation and then perturbatively correct it. Rather, you would have something uh, that only works once you include the infinite series of corrections. Yeah. So th th there's very valid reason to, to be skeptical about whether you can trust the equations in this regime. Um, but um, I don't know, maybe you can't, but just as a, as a statement of principle, if you if you forget about this, uh, you can contemplate the possibility of non-perturbative de-sitter vacuum. No, but the question is whether, uh, in some sense, we can incorporate also the alpha prime correction, which are not of polynomial type. Uh, do we expect that all what will change is the, it will be the form of this function f of h? Um, that's a very good question. I, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you can discuss that afterwards. That's a very, okay. it's a very interesting point. I, I don't really know. Okay, since I'm already running a bit late, let me come to the second part. So here we compactify now on more general Tori. So before I just compactify to time, 
So one coordinate was left, and now we compactify to a general number of dimensions uh, with coordinates x mu. So d is now the number of external dimensions, capital D and small d is the number of internal. So the internal coordinates are y m, and we, we just throw away this dependence. Now many things change. Most importantly, there's now uh, external B field components, B mu nu, this have to be redefined in some complicated kruser klein fashion. And I get extra vector fields B mu M. Um, and I also have to include the Kaluza Klein vector fields coming from the metric. And um, there's a classic result from the 90s due to everything I'm referencing here is from the 90s, by the way. So it's not very fashionable stuff, I suppose. But anyway, so there's a famous paper from the 90s by Maharana and Schwartz where they work out this reduction and I find this manifestly ODD invariant action. Uh, which is the, the generalization to higher dimensions of what I wrote before. Um, so you have the typical kinetic term for the generalized metric, H, again. You have now also kinetic terms, of course, for the external metric. Uh, you have, again, an ODD invariant dilaton. You have now the external B field. And importantly, uh, the curvature for the B field now has this uh, Schoen abelian schoen simons modification based on the gauge vectors A mu M. That is an ODD covariant combination of the closer Klein vectors and the, the gauge vectors that come from the, from the B field. Um, you have now also kinetic term for these vectors, F mu nu, F mu nu. Um, and well, that's the action. So now the question is, how does this generalize if I switch on alpha prime corrections? But there and, is a novelty here. You have this R term, which was not there before. And what is this? Uh, if you are in the duality invariant framework, what is this R? And uh, when you have the parentheses, the first term after the, this R here. Yes, that's the that's just the Einstein Hilbert term, the Ricci scalar for the external metric. So before the external I before see, the I external see. metric was I just see. the lapse function. I, here. In, in your in your ansatz, you have some. Yes, I understand that. Okay. Yeah, so here you just had the lapse function. Of course, there's no kinetic yes, term yes, of the yes, lapse yes, function. Yes. Uh, I got it. Okay. All right. Uh, so this is the action. Now, what happens if you uh, switch on alpha prime corrections? And that's the generalization of the analysis that Meissner did, but now to general dim uh, dimensions. Um, and this was done in this paper with uh, Camille Eloy and Henning Zamtleben. Um, and so what we did is we took the first order alpha prime corrections that you can find in the literature, um, it's Zeitlin, for instance. Uh, you do the compactification, and now you have to do a, a series of horrendous field redefinitions to have any chance of seeing anything that looks remotely duality invariant. But we did work out those field redefinitions. Um, and they are of the, of the kind that they make everything to bet to depend only on first order space time derivatives, except for the metric, which also enters with the Riemann tensor. So doing those redefinitions, we found a reduced action, which consists of large parts of terms, which are called I1 here, that are manifestly duality invariant, and one term O1, which is not. So let's first look at this I1. Uh, so you get natural stuff like Riemann squared or Riemann coupling to the external B field. Um, and here ODD is just acting trivially. This, this is just the external metric, G mu nu, which is a nerd, and the, uh, the, the, the curvature of the B field, which is the external B field, which is a nerd. But then you get a bunch of terms which involve scalar fields, again, combined in terms of this matrix S, as I, would, as I called it before. So this is this ODD matrix. And here we have a trace. So everything is ODD invariant. Everything is properly contracted. And here I've just displayed two terms out of uh, many terms. So the whole action uh, uh, really takes roughly half a page, uh, which looks uh, pretty tedious, but compared to the general reduction, believe me, it's much simpler and it's manifestly OBD invariant. So that works exactly as you would expect or exactly as it worked in one dimension. But then the interesting thing is there's one term, uh, one set of terms, which doesn't uh, work in this way. So there's this O1, which is H mu nu rho, the external B field, coupled to a three form, omega mu nu rho, which is of third order derivatives, so that this total term has four derivatives, as it should be at order alpha prime. 
And this omega-3 is this combination given here of the uh, internal metric or the set of scalar fields coming from there and the internal B field. And so at first sight, you might think, well, can't I just rewrite this in terms of some derivatives of, the, of this matrix S, the ODD matrix? Uh, but in fact, you can quickly convince yourselves that doesn't work. In fact, this is of odd power in S, and by this general reasoning I gave you before, this is not working. So this term is definitely not ODD invariant in the original sense. So now the question is, what is what's going on? Uh, ODD is supposed to be preserved to all orders in alpha prime according to Sen. Um, uh, so what's happening is the following, that there's a deformation, and that's this uh, generalized Green-Schwartz mechanism. So this three form omega-3 uh, cannot be written in terms of this matrix S, and is hence not ODD invariant, but you can check that it, that its exterior derivative can be written in this form, and it's just given here. So for its exterior derivative, you have four derivatives. So now there's a natural expression you can write, and you can check that that just works. So uh, this, of course, is now manifestly an ODD singlet. It's an invariant because of the trace. And so we learned that although omega-3 itself is not an ODD invariant object, uh, its exterior derivative is, which in turn means that under ODD transformations, omega-3 must go into something that is exact so that its exterior derivative uh, is zero. And if this is true, uh, we can just define a corrected curvature for uh, for the two form in fact uh, that is invariant so i define a new curvature h tilde three which is the old one uh, corrected by this omega three because then i can assign a modified uh, a transformation to the external two form uh, given by this x2 the two form that defined the variation of omega three and then the variation of omega of H3 in here will be D of X2, which just cancels the variation of the omega 3 from here. So this is now an invariant. And uh, because I defined this invariant uh, curvature H3 hat, uh, I can just interpret this term as coming from uh, uh, H tilde squared. So the mixed term coming from H tilde squared. And this makes, makes the ODD symmetry manifest. And the price to pay was that I had to assign a non-standard transformation for the external B field, the B mu nu, that before didn't have an ODD transformation, but now has a deformed ODD transformation. Olaf, this argument looks local. What happens if this delta of omega-3 is just closed form, not exact one? Yeah, so the, it, right. So these, these are global issues. Uh, that I would like to postpone maybe after the talk. Okay. Um, so maybe something that is slightly related, well, that is uh, related is that you can reformulate this basic mechanism in terms of frame fields um, in which perhaps things are a little better defined. So instead of working with, the, uh, with this ODD matrix S, you define it in terms of frames uh, where you have a composite SOD times SOD gauge symmetry. And in this case, you can write an explicit expression for omega-3 uh, in terms of composite connections for this local symmetry, right? So if you have a frame, frame field, you can define um, what's often called P's and Q's, and the Q's are um, composite connections for the local frame transformations. And in this case, you can write an explicit formula, not just for D of omega-3 or the variation of omega-3, but just omega-3 itself, and this is just this uh, difference here of the Sean Simons terms corresponding to the Qs, which are the connections for SOD left, and the Q bars, was a, which are connections for SOD right. And then you just work out how this transforms, and this uh, gives the usual transformation of a Sean Simons three form, which is canceled by um, by a appropriate transformation of the two form. Okay. So perhaps in this formulation, it's cleaner to think of the global issues uh, that, that are then exactly at the same level as, let's say, for the Sean Simons. Yeah, yeah, yes, it's, it's cleaner, but uh, still there are some issues which, might, which we might postpone. I would say yes, the yes, action but... which you write is effective action. Then, you know, because the argument which you make indicates that at the quantum level, 
there may be ODD symmetry, but not at the classical one. Like it's in the Chern Simon theory. If, if you put the action in the exponential, you know there's ambiguity 2 pi, which yeah. cancels in the quantum level, which may happen also here. Yeah, yeah. But your action is considered to be as effective action. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right, Let, we, we can come back to it after oh, yes. the talk, but the issue, so the, the point I want to make uh, with this uh, uh, frame reformulation and Sean Simon's forms is that then the issue is exactly the same that you would have, let's say, in heterotic string theory. We have elementary gauge fields and you have a sh added Sean Simon's terms of this kind to the three form curvature. And in fact, it's, okay, I'm run, I'm, let me just uh, finish with the third part in a few minutes, and then we have enough time for discussion still. Um, okay, so that was the second part. Now, uh, I will quickly explain how to understand this from the world sheet perspective. Um, so we start from a world sheet action that is duality invariant by being already adapted to dimensional reductions. So I want to think again of the target space fields uh, as being special, being independent of D coordinates YM. And so that amounts to a truncation of Kaluza Klein and, and, and winding modes on toroidal backgrounds. And now I can ask, can I write a world sheet action that is manifestly ODD invariant, assuming that the uh, target space field, so what are the background fields in the world sheet action, um, have this uh, uh, translation invariance property? And in fact, I can. And this is um, an extension of uh, old work by Arkady Zeitlin on writing duality invariant actions. Um, and in fact, after finishing this work, we realized that uh, uh, John Schwartz and Ashok Sen had already written this down in 93. Um, but here we give a novel interpretation uh, in terms of anomalies. So here's the action. Uh, the fields are as before, so B mu is the external two form. These are these ODD invariant uh, vector fields. I have two sets of, of coordinates or world sheet scalars, the X mu, the external coordinates, the Y, M, the internal ones. And importantly, the internal ones are now doubled. M is here the ODD index. And the way this works is that I have doubled the ODD indices, but, but uh, so I've doubled the coordinates but in such a way that there's a duality, self-duality constraint uh, originating from the equations of motion. So you will see here that this action is not a two-dimensionally Lorentz invariant. Rather, we have picked out here particular combinations of the world sheet metric H mu nu. So these are these complicated functions E and U, and also the indices uh, are split into sigma and tau directions, uh, uh, space-like and time directions on the, on the world sheet. So this is not at all a two-dimensional covariant. Um, but the, the, what we gain from this is that the equations of motion for the uh, for this double scalars imply some self-duality relations, uh, which tell you that in fact, only half of them are physical. And this is what brings you back to a standard world sheet action for bosonic string theory, or equivalently, you will find uh, that 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 the that these are chiral bosons, so they are effectively you have two two d of them, but effectively this brings it down to d scalars. So this is how this can be equivalent to standard world sheet action. Um, and what is happening uh, when you have uh, chiral fields, chiral fermions, or chiral bosons, of course, is that you expect the presence of anomalies. And surprisingly enough, uh, no one seemed to have noticed this for this kind of model, but it just works basically the same way as, as uh, in heterotic string theory, um, except that everything is now based on this composite uh, symmetry. So you have an SOD times SOD invariance, which is the invariance group of this uh, generalized metric HMN that multiplies here uh, one term in the world sheet action. And so uh, corresponding the, correspondingly, there are these currents. Um, which on shell satisfy these relations. So these underlined or, or uh, overlined indices are certain index projections done with, uh, with respect to the background generalized metric, which is, you can think of this effectively breaking it down to d-dimensional index, but never mind the details. What you can check is that on shell um, and going to 
uh, light cone coordinates, you find that these combinations of currents are just zero. And so the conservation laws for the other currents reduce to these uh, single term uh, contributions. And so if, if you look at the naive water identity you would like to have, uh, you would have this combination uh, going to momentum space uh, P minus J plus, plus P plus J minus, uh, that should be zero if the conservation law holds. But because half of these currents are already zero on shell, uh, you see that in fact this term you can, you, you can cancel. And so you have only one term left that should be then zero. And so this tells you that this two-point function must be zero. Uh, but of course, the two-point function of anti-emission operators should not be zero. And this really tells you that the SOD times SOD is anomalous. Okay, so that I think establishes the existence of an anomaly, but uh, in fact, we computed uh, it more explicitly by uh, computing the anomalous transformation of the one loop effective action, which is written here, integrating out the internal coordinates. And you find that this is not invariant, but rather under SOD times SOD uh, to lowest order, it transforms uh, in this fashion where Q and Q bar are these composite SOD times SOD connections. And of course, you see now what's happening. You can just cancel this anomaly by assigning the following non-trivial transformation to the B field itself, because you, you, you may remember that the B field, the external B field enters in the world sheet action by this term. So this then varies to cancel this contribution. And this is of course, exactly the transformation uh, that before we found must be assigned to the B field in order to make ODD a symmetry to, to first order and alpha prime or uh, in the frame formula, formulation, uh, it's this deformed SOD left times SOD right transformation that needs to be assigned to the two form. So this gives a nice world sheet interpretation of the target space Green Schwartz deformation. And in fact, as I mentioned several times already, this is precisely analogous uh, to the story for the heterotic string as pointed out by Hull and Witten and by Sen. Okay, I'm basically done now. There are a number of obvious things uh, you can try to do next particularly extending this to U duality or trying to use the, um, this formulation to compute uh, uh, duality invariant alpha prime corrections uh, by computing the beta functions and so on. But let me stop here. I think I'm, I went already over time. Thank you very much. Let's thank uh, Olaf for his very nice talk. Well, are there some questions? Maybe so. One question: um, Given the generalized uh, green short mechanism that you explained during the second part of your talk, I was wondering if already during the first part, when you were talking about the cosmological uh, solutions, one may wonder about non-standard ODD realizations and uh, alpha prime corrections at higher orders to ODD? Yeah, okay, thank you. Very good question. So the, the very first uh, issue, of course, is that you um, would have to ask, well, what happens? Well, first of all, what happens to the anomaly in the special case that you look at a cosmological background or in this uh, Green-Schwartz deformation, uh, what's special about the cosmological case. And in both cases, the answer is simply that uh, it degenerates. So because the two form doesn't exist in one dimension, uh, also its variation doesn't exist. So, so everything just uh, disappears. So this result of the, um, this result of the, of the need in general to have this generalized green Schwartz deformation is not in conflict with the observation that in one dimension, the cosmological setting, you don't need that effect. And in fact, everything is directly writable in terms of ODD objects. Um, now you could of course wonder, is there maybe some other kind of deformation uh, that you need to include in order to make ODD work in, in, in one dimension? And there I can just say, well, the explicit computations done so far, which went up to alpha prime cube show no such indication. Um, and in fact, we did play with this idea several times. Whenever we encounter an obstacle, something doesn't seem to work. We start to think, well, maybe you have to also deform in some way. Uh, 
But every time it turns out, no, you don't have to deform, you just have to do the computation correctly, and then it actually works. So I very strongly suspect that in the cosmological setting, there's no need for such a deformation, and every all evidence we have accumulated so far supports that, so that everything is just writable in terms of ODD objects in the naive sense. Okay, thanks. Are there some other questions? Yes. Yeah, so maybe I can ask about this uh, doubled sigma model. So you show that uh, one loop, you could uh, get the, this Green Schwartz, this generalized Green Schwartz transformation from the anomaly there. Uh, is there anything you can say about higher loops for the doubled sigma model? Uh, yeah, well, not too much, unfortunately. So <clears throat> we we did uh, uh, we did uh, derive rederive the Maharana Schwartz action. Um, so the 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 zero zeroth order and alpha prime or the two derivative action by doing the one loop uh, beta function computation starting from the duality invariant world sheet, um, and that that works. So you just get it out correctly. And we're currently working on a paper to extend this to, to two loops, uh, perhaps three loops. Um, but it turns out that this is a very hard problem for the simple reason that the, this, uh, the sigma model um, where is, here, is, is not manifestly Lorentz or diffeomorphism invariant. So how actually to do the beta function computation beyond uh, one loop uh, is already a very subtle problem. And um, and it's it's not clear yet whether this is actually uh, doable in, in in principle. I would say, uh, well, maybe that's too strong a statement. But it's it's a very hard problem, and um, and we're working on it. But uh, I don't have a very clean answer yet. Yeah, because it's such a non-standard theory, you might worry in principle that all kinds of things can go wrong. Uh, yes. Okay, yes, so it's pro probably the, the safe thing to say is if you want to fix those uh, coefficients of the higher derivative terms, uh, probably this is not the most practical way to go about it. You should probably work with a more standard world sheet theory and then reinterpret in the duality invariant form at the end. This is more like a point of principle that in principle there is a duality invariant formulation that allows you to understand directly in an ODD duality in varying fashion, various phenomena like this need for a Green Schwartz deformation. But I would say it's pretty safe to say that's not the most practical way to go about fixing, for instance, those coefficients. Okay, there are some other questions. If no, if not, let's thank Olaf again.